Um, first, me, let me um, acknowledge that protocol has been established. And let me indicate from the outset that I have come here really because the continuing contribution of the United States of America to the stability and well-being of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and for that matter, the Turks and Caicos Islands, and by extension, the entire region continues to be indispensable to the security of our future. And a few weeks ago, the minister responsible for national security and myself were in the Republic of Haiti when the Attorney General of the United States of America appeared before the prime ministers there assembled. And we each had the opportunity to address issues of concern to ourselves and the region and our respective countries. And in return, he responded on behalf of the United States government. I had indicated that when I came to office in 2012, I had the privilege to speak to the then Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, who telephoned me on behalf of the government to congratulate me. And I indicated to her that notwithstanding the contribution of great consequence and significance that her government was making through up, bat, and other gestures of cooperation, that there was a compelling urgency faced in small countries like ours over the continuing impact of illegal weaponry being brought into our country. And that if I were to identify any major interest on my part, it was to see if through increased collaboration increased sharing of intelligence, we would be able to stem the tide to save lives and provide the victims, those who are killed in particular, and those who do the killing, both victims, to try and somehow give them a future in our country through being able to stop what has been a calamitous development on a continuing basis. I must say that the Secretary of State responded magnificently, and we had a high-ranking State Department official come to the Bahamas as a direct result of that conversation. Invaluable discussions took place and the acknowledgement that we've heard today was reaffirmed at the end of those meetings by, by acknowledging how close we actually are in our levels of cooperation and how important it is both to the security of the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos Islands, and to the United States of America. And by way of introduction, the final point I'd like to make is that in today's world and today's technology, we must never lose sight of the fact that millions of people pass through our waters and ships. and that the potential for disaster 
both natural and man-made, is always present. And the point I wanted to personally make, and I make on every occasion, is that because we have the obligation to cover 100,000 square miles of water, being an archipelagic nation, the resources of the Bahamas will never be sufficient to allow us to provide the level of coverage that is so vital to security in these three countries that are working together. And therefore, it, it didn't take much for me to know that we have to urge our friends of the United States of America to recognize on a continuing and increasing basis that as we, each of our territories, dedicate resources to the protection of our country, we're doing so for the greater protection of all three of the territories. And that one cannot argue with any degree of persuasion that they know where the obligation of the Bahamas ends in terms of what we're doing for our people and where it begins for what we as a country, what we are doing for the United States of America. And so it is in that context that I want to thank again the United States of America. And I wanted Bahamians to understand how entirely relevant it is for us to recognize that we are the closest offshore country to the United States of America. That we begin 50 miles off Miami and 48 nautical miles off Palm Beach. One in terms of Bimini and the other in terms of West End Grand Bahama. And that thousands of our people became Americans. And I've said that for all of my life, the mother of my father first moved to Miami and then to 45 West 110th Street, New York, where whenever I was going to school in England, I stopped. And she spent up to her death some 68 years there. And that really reflects the extent to which thousands of our people have moved to the United States of America and back. And so that we truly understand the meaning of that, when the Attorney General opened his introduction to us, he recognized that he had come from Barbados. His parentage was of Barbados. And before him, Colin Powell and the others. So we live in a, a changing world that is becoming closer in terms of the necessity of our policies one country to the other to understand those occasions where sovereignty must be minimized and the overall safety of the citizenry takes priority. Where borders mean very little when we are trying to protect 
the people of our country, as you have heard. In the Bahamas National Anti-Drug Strategy 2011, it was stated that countering drug trafficking at sea will continue to be a priority. And in consolidating Bahamian national security efforts, and that in this context, Operation Bahamas and Turks and Caicos Islands, OPBAT, will continue to be a given priority. So as we assemble here today for the ribbon cutting ceremony of the new United States Coast Guard hangar, I'm endeavoring to remind each and all of us of our commitment to remain ever mindful of that reality. As you've heard, OBMAT plays the premier role in drug interdiction in the air and maritime spaces of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. And without it, we would be hard pressed to detect, let alone stem, the illicit flow of narcotics, firearms, and trafficking of people through our territories. This new facility, which replaces a hangar that suffered extensive damage in 2008 during Hurricane Ike, we are told will be fully used by OPBAT law enforcement officers and reaffirms the solidarity between what is called the tripartite, the three partners in this crime-fighting initiative, the United States of America, the Turks and Caicos Islands, and the Bahamas. This hangar has been characterized as being the last that will be built, meaning that if there can be hurricane winds that will take this out, Well, no one believes that, and it, it means that Nagu will probably disappear. That's how much effort was put in to making this a hurricane-proof facility, which will be very reassuring to the people of Inagua. This hangar with approximately 17,500 square feet of floor space, represents the culmination of almost two years of work and approximately $20 million in capital investment. In addition, in fact, it, I was told that it's a good thing it was built during the time it was built, during recession, um, because it really would be a $30 million um, investment. In addition, it was designed and constructed to withstand the level of gale force winds that I spoke of. But it really represents a meaningful symbol of our partnership, one of unwavering, resolute, and undiminished commitment. Over the past 31 years, OBBAT's mandate has been expanded from working singularly towards the elimination of illicit trafficking of narcotics to combating all the peripheral activities that threaten national and regional security. It is a great joy, therefore, to hear that the data collection method employed by OBBAT has been revised to be more reflective of trends, such that our joint counter-narcotics efforts might even be more targeted and effective. Since the original facility was rendered operationally ineffective in 2008 by Hurricane Ike, Coast Guard operations, have you heard, have been split between Providencialis and the Turks and Caicos Islands and here in Greater Nagua. Naturally, this situation has extended the amount of time required to effectively mobilize patrols and other time-sensitive operations. Now with the completion of this new structure, Helicopters, pilots, and crew will all be in one location and will be able to increase their overall efficiency and decrease response times for the benefit of the three partner states. 
The development of the hangar over the last five years has greatly mirrored relations between our three countries, and particularly Bahamian-American bilateral relations. Cooperation in the field has become closer, and the Admiral, Rear Admiral has just indicated that. Transparency in operations has increased, and overall effectiveness has become the order of the day. American technical support over the past few years has included state-of-the-art aircraft, interceptor vessels, and capacity building through training programs for Bahamian officials to navigate the legal path to pursue and conclude cases against those who enter our waters illegally for nefarious purposes. As Her Excellency Nicole Avan, former ambassador of the United States to the Bahamas, remarked, and I quote, OPBAT represents one of our most successful and important law enforcement partnerships. It has continued to shore up the foundations of regional security cooperation. And though the past few years of financial difficulty have placed great burdens on the law enforcement agencies of our nations, OPBAT has supplemented any operational deficit these agencies may have suffered. And through this partnership, we have overcome years of budget constraints to maintain our efforts to counter the illicit flow of narcotics, arms, and persons. Through our partnership, the Tripod has also supplemented experiential deficits, American operational training and know-how, combined with local knowledge of reefs, shoals, weather trends, and transport routes, have proved to be successful, a successful combination over the years. Operation Enduring Friendship has been a pillar in American-Bahamian relations and has proved effective thus far. The Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, initiative has also buttressed the ongoing work of the tireless men and women in the Royal Bahamas Defense Force and the United States Coast Guard. If I may adapt the old adage, no man is an island, which speaks to interdependency, I could say in an ironic twist that in the context of OPBAT, no country is an island. And through OPBAT, the United States, the Bahamas, and the Turks and Caicos Islands are much more effective at policing borders and adopting a more proactive attitude in the pursuit of border security on a drug-free zone. The OPBAT agreement has made the three members of the Tripartite realize how much we rely on each other. We cannot maintain the security of this region alone, nor can we exist without the support we give to and receive from each other. In recognition of this, I publicly commit that OPBAT will continue to receive the full unwavering support and cooperation of the government of the Bahamas. So for my part, I therefore wish to join the Minister responsible for national security, Dr. Nottage, to thank the civil and military personnel, those who are seen and those who are unseen, who labor to support the ongoing mission of OPBAT. You who work while we sleep and who risk your lives that we might be safe, I thank you. As our governments continue to share information, airspace, intelligence, and conversation against the backdrop of an increasingly effective OPBAT, let this new hangar build on the ground we have gained against illicit drug trafficking and the movement of people, arms, cash, and narcotics. Let it stand as a bulwark on the collected threshold of our three sovereign territories. May we continue to move ever forward and onward to stem illicit trafficking and press relentlessly for a more secure and prosperous fraternity 
between our nations. And before I conclude, let me take advantage of the fact that I am here in Inaugua as Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and I've been accompanied by the Minister of Transport with specific reference to Ministry of Aviation and the Minister of Works in the presence of the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of State. I want to say that the government of the Bahamas to the people of Inagua, I speak specifically and to its representative, the government of the Bahamas cannot arrive at that terminal building and then walk from that terminal building to this edifice, the magnificence of which was spoken of by Dr. Nottage. So before I came, I told the Minister of Works to be here. He's advised me he's brought his structural and quantity, his engineering, his engineering team here. And they put in my hands, I want the Americans to know, some pretty pictures. And I will deem from this platform, like they say, and I hereby declare <laughs> that this here <laughs> will be transformed from this piece of paper to that site over there or an appropriate site situate over there so that when the international flights come in to Inagua or the domestic flights come in to Inagua that the people will be able to be met in the same way that the helicopter pilots will be met when they come into this site. I, Perry Gladstone Christie, so declare. My final point is this. For about 30 of those 40 years that you heard of in terms of my representation, in my annual budget remarks, the record would reflect that I have spoken about the remarkable diversity of wildlife, species of birds on this island. I have created a picture of the Galapagos Islands and the thousands of people who travel to those islands to experience the richness of their diversity wildlife. There is no flamingo resident colony in the world that can match the flamingo resident colony of this island. There are 100 species of birds because of the salt. There are even the shrimps that universities would want to come in to study. Schools have come in to study. There are wild donkeys and whatever else. This is my final declaration. When my first ter in my first term, I said to the Inter-American Development Bank, and this is very relevant, Admiral, to your men who would be stationed here, because I'm now going to speak about an economic intervention that will give them, when they fly in, they might be able to go someplace and relax and, you know, I don't know if they have cocktails, but have a cocktail. <laughs> but I got them to recognize that the time has come for an island that has been magnificently contributed to by an American corporation in terms of the salt production on this island, Morton Salt, 
from about 1936 on a continuous basis, they have kept the civilization of this island alive and vibrant. But it's a one company town. The world is replete of examples of successful integration of environmentally rich segments of countries into the tourism mix. And so they agreed with me and they had consultants come down and consultants do work here. Even the Spanish government made a contribution to the process in terms of uh, recognizing the historical um, import, well, the importance of it. And then for reasons that I shan't discuss here, we had to suspend the consultancy. God does not want something like this for the world not to see. The last time I went onto the flats and looked at the wildlife was about 30 years ago when the Honorable George Smith was the Minister of Agriculture. The children of the Bahamas ought to have the opportunity for it. So coming down here, I asked Dr. Nottich and the two female ministers with me um, whether philosophically they would object to my vision of sitting firstly with the movers and shakers of Inagua to see whether or not the will exists with some of them to take advantage of an opportunity that will be theirs to get involved in a new economic development here. but to state that it will have the full support and involvement, even in dollars and cents, of the government of the Bahamas to make it happen. I don't know if my ministers mumble mm or ah. I see them smiling. But the one thing I can tell you is that this edifice represents an enduring commitment of the United States of America to this island. The commitment of the Bahamas government as evinced by me with respect to a terminal building clearly um, is important, but one that is of enduring importance is one that will involve a new dimension in the economy of Anagua. And I'm saying, because I have deemed that I only have, I'm only going to remain for this final term in public life, it means I must do it now. And so this occasion, Mr. Dinkelman, has been one of immense significance to the future of this island. The Americans have set a standard and a pace in terms of its commitment, that is, you have. And we, on our part, will fulfill the promise that we have made to the people of this island. And the people of this island, I want to conclude by saying, who have proven to be of an indomitable spirit, who have withstood all of the challenges that have been thrown at this island, and who, consistent with what we are all about in these islands, a recognition that inbuilt into our own philosophy of life is that even though we're going to get knocked down, we're always going to get back up. It is my pleasure, therefore, to have been with you on this occasion for the commissioning of this new edifice, 
to have taken advantage of the Americans' occasion with their indulgence, I'm sure, um, because this was all about theirs, and to throw in a little bit about what um, I'm going to do. So I crave, I mean, I thank you for your indulgence in allowing me to speak of matters other than this particular building.